It's Monday, October 31st. You're watching The Big Story with me, Harian Tudiman. Subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you will not miss an episode. South Koreans are demanding answers after more than 150 people were killed in a crowd crush during Halloween celebrations on Saturday night. President Yoon suk Yeol today opened a memorial in central Seoul, paying respects to the victims of the disaster. Now, the country has started a week of national mourning with official events cancelled and flags flying at half-mast nationwide. On Saturday, tens of thousands of people packed the narrow streets of Seoul's Itaewon district before the deadly crush. According to witnesses, no apparent crowd control measures were put in place. Our South Korea correspondent Chang Mei Chun joins us from Seoul. Mei Chun, for those of us who are unfamiliar with the Itaewon neighborhood, can you describe the area for us and how it may have led to the deadly crush? So I'm standing here at um, Itaewon Station next to Hamilton Hotel where the uh, crowd crash happened. Behind you can see uh, the alley where um, the incident happened and it is a very small alley about uh, 4 meters wide and uh, 40 meters long and it is one of three alleys that lead up to the main street of Itaewon where, the, where all the clubs and pubs are located. Uh, investigations are still ongoing so we're not sure what exactly happened but according to eyewitness accounts and what observers tell us there was a huge crowd coming down from the alley and then there is this other huge crowd going upwards towards um, the main street and they created a bottleneck situation right in the middle and then someone fell and created a domino effect. And what is the mood like in Itaewon today? How are South Koreans coming to terms with the tragedy? I think people are still trying to come to terms with the tragedy. Many are still in shock. You know, Itaewon is usually filled with festivities um, every Halloween and today being Halloween. But um, a lot of the shops are still closed. Uh, the roads are still closed. And there is this very sombre mood in the air. The Prime Minister has promised a thorough investigation. What will be some key areas that South Koreans will be demanding that the government look at? People are first asking how such a thing could have happened, you know, why there was no better crowd control to, to prevent over congestion, and also why only 200 police officers were deployed, why not more? People are also asking why the roads at Taiwan were not closed with such a big crowd is expected. Investigations are still ongoing, but um, the authorities have said that you know the expected the numbers expected were no different from you know the years before COVID. So there were no outstanding circumstances for them to deploy more people. But the police has admitted that while they did foresee you know big numbers. They did not expect the huge number of casualties and fatalities. South Korea correspondent Chang Mei Chun in Seoul. A desperate search for survivors continues in the western city of Morbi in India's Gujarat state after a packed suspension bridge collapsed on Sunday. Police say more than 130 bodies have been recovered so far and death toll could rise further. More than 400 people were said to be on and around the suspension bridge at the time of the collapse. Built by the British in the late 1800s, the bridge had only reopened several days earlier after months of repairs. Over in the Philippines, a powerful tropical storm has left behind a trail of death and destruction on the southern island of Mindanao. Flooding and landslides wiped out entire villages with the death toll climbing to 98 and dozens reported missing. The storm, which is the year's second most deadly cyclone to hit the country, has caused infrastructural damage estimated at 384 million pesos or over 9 million Singapore dollars. British billionaire Richard Branson has declined Singapore's invitation to a live televised debate with Law and Home Affairs Minister K. Shanmugam. This comes after his blog post criticised the Singapore government's use of the death penalty to deter drug trafficking. 
In a statement issued on his blog, Mr Branson says he declined the invitation as he felt that a debate on such a platform would lack nuance and also that the conversation needed local voices. HDB has reported a record deficit of $4.367 billion for the 2021 financial year, which is about 86% higher than the year before. A bulk of the deficit, about $3.85 billion, was a result of the expected loss for flats being built, disbursement of CPF housing grants and a gross loss on the sale of subsidised flats under the Home Ownership Programme. The loss under the program is almost double when compared to the previous year, which HDB says translates to more subsidies and grants for buyers. Housing correspondent Michelle Ng joins us now for more. Michelle, what does the record deficit mean and will it affect BTO prices in any way? So to answer your second question, no, the deficit will not affect BTO prices in any way. This is because um, HDB builds and sells new flats at subsidised prices that are below market rates. Essentially, what's happening is that HDB makes a loss on every flat that it develops. So the more number of flats that HDB sells in a year, the higher their deficit. For instance, um, in the 2021 financial year, HDB completed more than 13,000 units, as in they handed keys over to the buyers. Compared with the previous year, HDB completed around 8,000 units. This was mostly because we were in the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic and construction works were very disrupted. So when HDB completes fewer units, their deficit was also correspondingly lower. While this figure of 4.367 billion sounds really high, I think it's helpful to know that HDB incurs a deficit every single year. And this deficit is fully covered by a grant from the MOF. But what's important to know is that HDB has announced that they have plans to ramp up the supply of BTO flats, not just for this year, but also for 2023 and the following years, depending on the housing demand. While the deficit will likely break more records in the future and likely increase in the coming years, the increased flat supply will mean a little bit of relief for those who are hoping to get a BTO flat, which is good news for everyone who's looking for a unit all around. Housing correspondent Michelle Ng. UOB has set out emissions targets to meet its net zero goal by 2050. The bank's commitments cover six sectors with the highest greenhouse gas emissions, including power, automotive, oil and gas. In a sponsored interview with UOB's Chief Sustainability Officer, Eric Lim tells us more on how these targets will affect the global economy and society. When we talk about net zero, what we're really talking about is transforming our entire global economy and society from the way we live, work and play, from one that creates 50 gigatons of greenhouse gases emissions per year to one that's essentially carbon neutral. And this will affect everything we do, the way we generate electricity, the way we build our buildings, the way we grow our food, even the way we transport ourselves across the world we can see all of these environmental calamities around us even this year in 2022. So it's critical that we start moving on climate action. And as a bank, it's important for us to be able to bring the right kind of financing, green, sustainable, as well as transition finance in supporting our large customers, as well as our small and medium enterprises along on this journey towards a net zero future. And those are our top stories today. Visit StraitsTimes.com for more news and our YouTube channel for more videos. Subscribe by clicking the red button below. I'm Harian Todiman. Join us tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.